Hi, I'm Brian Moran, founder of Government CIO. Welcome to Government CIO Magazine. Hello and welcome to Government CIO Magazine. Today we're sitting down with Mr. Tony Trinkel, Chief Information Officer at CMS. A lot of this is based on, uh, obviously, every year we look at our, our budget and our investments uh, in, in new systems as well as the existing legacy systems. So much of this is looked at uh, from a systems life cycle perspective. Uh, what do we have in place today? What do we have in place in the, in the future? This technology review board that I spoke of earlier does that as well as uh, when we put together our, our 300s and other investment vehicles, we look at the existing systems. and. Uh, also projecting out new systems as to whether they'll be uh, utilized both now and in the future. We uh, do it in a number of ways. We, we certainly try to walk before we run. So a lot of what we do is we, we look at them in, in very uh, specific environments, uh, pilot test them, uh, start using them with the uh, for example, for mobility, I've got an iPad uh, that I've been testing in terms of utilizing it with our uh, our uh, infrastructure here, and we're also uh, looking at cloud computing for some specific applications. Uh, so we, we, we pilot and test uh, before we run. We also work very closely with the department on a number of these uh, as well because there's department policies and uh, and various guidelines that they do. So it's it's something we we approach over uh, a, you know a multi-year way of looking at things. One of which, of course, ties back to the the life cycle of the uh, equipment. Some example, laptops have a four to five year life. So we want to make sure that we're already moving towards the next uh, stages with them. But also looking at where the marketplace is going. Uh, so we consult with uh, people like the gardeners and others, and as well as looking at what are some of the best practices that uh, not only other federal agencies do, but also the private sector as well. Well, technology is really driven by business requirements. We shouldn't be purchasing technology just for its own sake. So part of that really starts off with what are our business imperatives and how are they changing over the next uh, several years and then how does technology support that. So we work very closely with our business uh, partners on business transformation plans and technology transformation plans and then look at how we can link them together over the next uh, number of years to make sure we're meeting the changes in business. And as you know, we've uh, had a lot of changes over the past several years because of legislative mandates, most significantly the Affordable Care Act, which has really allowed us to look at uh, ways to change very rapidly, but at the same time, it challenges us to change very rapidly. So it, it's, it's kind of moved us into a different uh, cycle of, uh, of uh, change than we've ordinarily had to have over the last uh, you know, 20 years. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked that because we have a, uh, a big concern about the uh, skills atrophy or even the lack of skills. So one of the things I've asked uh, our folks to do is really do a skills inventory, but not just the skills of federal employees, but also the skills of the contracting uh, support team. So then once you look at that, you say, okay, what are the skills that we have in place today? which ones are being done by the feds, which ones are being done by contractors. Is the mix correct? Is the, uh, are there gaps between our desired state and today's state? And then what do we need to do to, uh, to, to bridge that gap? And that's uh, the process we're in now is really looking at that across our enterprise. Yeah, well, we're mainly a, a contracting uh, shop 
here, in other words, a contractor shop, I should say. No, so we do do a lot of contracting because we have uh, probably 80-20 with 80% of the workforce is contractor and about 20% is uh, federal employees. So part of what we need to look at is the mix of contractors we have, how are we uh, managing those contracts uh, across the, the various types of business lines we have, and uh, how do we move forward uh, in the future with uh, getting that right uh, set of skill sets. So you don't want to just have existing contractors who've been here forever uh, doing all of your work. You want to, you know, have a, a mix of those who understand your environment and new contractors who can provide uh, additional skill sets, maybe additional perspectives, and uh, also help keep the uh, existing contractors who've been here for a while on their toes in terms of bringing in uh, new ideas and approaches. So I think it, I think uh, competition is healthy. I think also as we move towards uh, new ways of doing business, how do we develop more flexible contracting vehicles? Uh, how do we use things such as cloud computing to help uh, drive uh, different approaches to how we uh, get services? And then how do we, uh, looking down the road, what's the effective mix of contracts done by us in-house and using uh, government-wide vehicles such as GSA uh, schedules. Absolutely. I, I think one of the, uh, the keys that we really need to uh, make sure we develop more here is project management skills. Uh, we have major programs uh, with very uh, uh, extensive and intensive development schedules, so it's critical that we have people there who can work well as project managers, as systems developers, systems integrators, <coughs> and other types of uh, skill sets. So it's managing the contractor, managing the project, having enough technical knowledge that you can understand even if you're not doing the actual coding yourself, you understand that you're getting the value for the dollar. Those are the type of skill sets that we're really looking at in terms of gaps and, and how we fill them with our employees and also at various levels too. You don't want to bring everybody into the senior level so how do you begin to develop this uh, succession planning and career development so you can bring in new people who may have uh, newer technical skill sets but uh, are not as um, savvy when it comes to knowing the business of, of how we uh, do things here at CMS. We're uh, actually uh, two of the areas where we're very much uh, looking at new approaches to development or the whole area of developing the, uh, the federally facilitated exchange and the uh, data hub to support that. Uh, they're doing a lot of uh, agile uh, development there. We also have a lot of projects that are being spun up out of our uh, innovation center. These are projects with very tight deadlines and very quick uh, implementation. So we're also looking very closely at how we can use agile uh, development in both of those areas. We're already doing it pretty much in the exchange area, but now we're beginning to look at how we can do it in the innovation area as well. Absolutely. Uh, part of what we're looking at is, is not the uh, one-size-fits-all approach, but we've uh, actually uh, been working with, worked very closely with our business committee on what we call an expedited uh, project life cycle, and uh, it involves uh, looking at several approaches and what are the best uh, types of situations to use their approaches. So I don't like to say that Agile is the best for everything or uh, some other blueprinting or some other approach is best for uh, all situations, but what are the criteria that we're trying to uh, meet and then what is the approach or approaches that can best meet that and we have, as I say, everything from, from real uh, legacy systems that we're doing continuous releases and we're just to keep them going to these brand new projects where we're basically creating new systems out of uh, you know nothing at this point. So uh, each of them requires different approaches to, to work.
we spend a few moments talking about the work we're doing in shared services. Uh, shared services is basically an enterprise approach that uh, allows us to uh, build certain types of systems that can support a variety of business processes. And one of the challenges of that is developing something that can meet uh, various uh, different types of uh, business requirements. But the good part about that is it moves us away from very program specific solutions, which is how we've done a lot of our work in the past. So for example, we're building a uh, enterprise identity management system that will allow us to have a, uh, an enterprise approach to identity management for both providers and beneficiaries and others where we have it in the past. We're also building an enterprise portal which will allow a lot of our stakeholders to come in and have uh, tailored approaches to allow them to do multiple business processes with us. And we're also developing something called Master Data Management, which is a way to provide a, a reference book for uh, providers and other key stakeholders that we can then use across programs. For example, I mentioned uh, with the Affordable Care Act, we're moving towards uh, looking at various ways to pay providers. Uh, traditionally, we've had the fee-for-service uh, way of uh, paying providers where you pay a provider for service. Now we're moving towards approaches where we will have different payment ways to reward providers based on quality or other types of uh, requirements. To do that uh, requires uh, synchronizing a lot of the information about a provider so you don't end up overpaying them or uh, doing other types of uh, mistakes that could cause uh, overpayments, underpayments, uh, different types of uh, business disruptions. So something like master data management allows us to do that. And then we're looking at other uh, types of shared services such as eligibility uh, shared service that allow us to look at uh, uh, participant eligibility or beneficiary eligibility across various programs. Uh, things such as uh, business rules or some common business rules that we can propagate across. So those are the type of things where we uh, think that shared services can pay some major dividends over the next several years for us.